refreshing, but also brave, exciting, unflinching. Caleb zipped the fly of his jeans and reached towards his brother's bedside for his mobile phone. Man up, mace, he said, unclipping the jack. Unless you want a paste in. I'm sick of being the only responsible one here. Chillax, bro, Mason said, before you get an ulcer or something. You've been like a coiled spring ever since that fucking court case. Easy, mate. Powerful, it's visceral. It's just so immediate, you know, it's, it brings the day of Brexit to life in a really imaginative way. I'm really interested in politics and I read the blurb and, you know, set on the day of the referendum and I thought, oh great, I can't wait for that. But if you're coming to it from that interest point, you're almost waiting for that bit to get started. It's quite subtle. So I think if anything, you might even get more out of it if you're not that interested in politics. The central character, Caleb, is a typical person, really. He's not sure how the vote is going to affect him. He doesn't even want to vote at the start of the novel. He's got other things on his mind. It's a real people-centred look at the debate and like how it affects our lives in different ways. I kind of wish Rachel could have written about the Brexit debate when it was around, and just humanising it in those terms. And it's packed with Rachel's trademark writing, you know, there's that real kind of sharpness and humour. Uh, and darkness as well. Uh, no, it's fabulous. Your new novel, Easy Meat, Day in the Life of a Ronda. Why did you want to write about Caleb Jenkins? I just wanted to write about young people growing up today because although I'd written about that, so we're 20 years on now, and I still think that young people from the Ronda's voices still ignore. It's also a great kind of comment on the celebrity culture that youth are saturated in and the kind of empty promises it offers them and you know the main character Caleb who's who's had his kind of 15 minutes of fame on on this kind of terrible reality show um, and the lack of opportunities he has and how hard it is for him. And who is Caleb Jenkins to you? Amalgamation of all the men I see in the Ronde Valley every day. The book is, 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 is from a, a male, male point of view. Um, your other fiction is usually, but not always been from a female point of view. How much of a challenge did you find it to convincingly inhabit Caleb's world? It's not so much of a challenge to write from a male perspective, it's kind of the same as writing from a female perspective, but I love doing it because it gives me an extra layer of protection. Like everyone thinks that everything I write comes from um, my, my own life. So when I use male protagonists, it always throws people off a little. Nice to read from a male perspective, and I think Rachel did that so well because there's a lot of things that you sort of about masculinity at the moment that are really challenging for young men. It's kind of a bit of an identity crisis. I've got a brother and a boyfriend, and there's a lot of things to navigate. Um, and I think Caleb is a really great central character because he kind of is quite curious, he has a lot of questions about things, he's got quite a good moral compass, but he doesn't like align himself with one side of the argument too easily. He's very thoughtful, which is why I really enjoyed reading his voice. He wondered what Savannah was doing now, if she was up yet, eating her own breakfast. She was the one with the restraining order, but it was Caleb who couldn't get her out of his mind, not even after all this time. He tried to push the thought away before it began to sting. Caleb in the book is on the verge of a, a big decision. How was he thinking about his life? Caleb's just trying to get by day by day. He's not the big decision he's about to make, he doesn't know how big it is. Um, it's only sort of halfway through the book he, he even decides to go and vote. Um, politics are in the background of his life. You know, he's just trying to get, he's just trying to get um, to the end of the day um, with some money left in his account. That's what he's thinking about. You commented that you didn't really want to write a political book. I would say that all your books are political. Um, perhaps this one's more overtly, but did you realise at the point, right, I am writing a political book? My work is political, but with a small p, I always think. Brexit is such a divisive thing that I, I, was, I was quite scared of writing about it. That's why I said I didn't want to write a political thing again. And also I'd just done a play which was overtly um, political. 
I'm always very keen not to um, make any judgments on political views or anything. I, I try to leave as much up to the reader as I can. He hit eject, the street's disc expelled from the stereo like a silver tongue out of a robot's mouth. He threw it onto the passenger seat and balanced the young father's case on his kneecap, struggling to remove the disc while still holding the steering wheel with his left hand. When he'd got it out, he slipped it into the stereo, the first track starting with a mad synthesizer riff, buzzing like a mosquito crossed with a chainsaw. He slid into the right lane to overtake a haulage truck, carrying a mini digger, then sidled back to the left, foot pressed on the accelerator, maintaining a steady 70 miles per hour. The chorus to the song launched like a rocket, a pulsating keyboard lick underneath it, setting Caleb's nerves on edge. The singer chanting, still running, still running, still running. Well, the reason the music was important, because the, when I was at university, sort of the summers between university, I always worked in factories. So like the radio is the only thing which keeps you going when you're doing like really, really boring work. And it was a way to get into Caleb's sort of emotional life, what was really going on in his head, um, aside from the butchery. Choosing the songs, I wanted them to be quite political, but also the kind of like political you hear on the radio. Part of your writing journey then, are you the contributor, editor, maker of a fanzine? What was that about? My teenage fanzine was about the local music scene. Um, and myself. <laughs> it's just a very egotistical piece of um, writing, I suppose. I, I want to be a music journalist. So, and obviously I couldn't be a music journalist because I was 15, so I made my own magazine. Music was the main, my main art form. There was no books growing up. Never went to see plays. Um, didn't like films, didn't like TV. But I loved music, so that was my way of looking at the world, really. Lyrics are kind of poetry. The music my mother listened to, country and western music, was they were all little stories hidden inside a song. What was the jump for you then to do something that could be a book? Well, I just started writing about myself. I wanted to tell the story I had about growing up in the Rhonda. I hadn't read anything. I didn't think that any books had been set in the Rhonda before uh, because that's how little I knew about literature. And I thought, I'm going to be the first to do it. I'm going to be the first to set a book in the Rhonda. And, Tell everyone honestly my story of growing up. The Ronda I grew up in is a paradox really because in lots of ways it was a very matriarchal society, you know, the figure of the Welsh man, strong Welsh women I was surrounded by growing up. But in terms of women having a voice in a literary way, in a cultural way, well, they were more or less invisible, which is one of the reasons I was so knocked out by Rachel's fiction debut because one, I'd not read a woman from the Ronda. And two, I'd never read writing about the Rhonda quite like Rachel's as well. It was just so unflinching. She doesn't pretend to be anything she isn't, and she bravely puts her perspective out there, and it makes it very unique. Sometimes the, the, the kind of harder realities of that world in the aftermath of it, you don't like to confront so much, um, unless you're Rachel, of course. The book came out at the kind of height of Cool Cymru. There was a lot of optimism around the youthful culture of Wales, this sense of young people finding a new sense of Welsh identity in the music, the rugby was doing well, you know, we had people like Matthew Rees and Johan Griffith in the cinema. All of a sudden you felt like you had your own youth culture as a Welsh person. Um, and yet, you read that book and you realise the reality of, of many young people's lives in that period and how, you know, Cymru wasn't cool at all for, for people who were living in in situations where you know it's a deprived community, there's dysfunctional families, all the kind of pressures of the post-industrial valleys. Um, and I think it's a real reality lesson to read, to kind of cry for help for that generation and what they went through and how people weren't listening to them. It's slightly bizarre. I had a book out and it was in the local library. My mother used to clean the library when I was, when I was a kid. She used to come to work with them. Old books. That's the only that's the only books we had was <laughs> the ones I used to come to. I 
think the stories are challenging and I think maybe on your first read you might find some of the scenes quite shocking but at the same time um, I think that's what makes them real, that's what helps readers to connect with them. Certainly that volatility and the sense of frustration, the, the sense that something big is going to happen, that something has to change about your life is something that, that most people will have experienced growing up and will, will be familiar with. Imagine yourself, you're outside Truoki Library. 20 years ago, the first book was published. What would you say to that 20-year-old Rachel Trezise? I'd say, are you sure you want to do this because people are actually going to pay attention? <laughs> like, I thought the book would be published and nobody, you know, nobody would really notice. And then it won quite a big prize and people started to take notice. I just wish I was a bit more prepared. I was always pushing to, to be noticed, but I never thought I would be. <laughs> so then, so then when, it, when those fantasies came true, it was all a bit worrying. Your books have, have won prizes. It's won the Orange Futures, Dylan Thomas Award, um, the Edge Hill Short Story Prize. What does the vindication of the prizes meant to you as a writer? It's just um, nice that somebody appreciates your writing. It's like somebody saying, yeah, carry on. We're giving you the permission to try another book. It's also a lot of pressure as well. You have to live up to being good, to being worthy of that prize. We're on Triwoki High Street. There's a certain buzz in the air. It won the High Street of the Year a couple of years ago. But what was it like, do you think, for Triwoki to win that prize? Oh, huge, I would have thought, because nobody would think of coming to Triwoki High Street <laughs> to do their shopping. Nobody would see it, like, nobody would be uh, aware of it. Everybody thinks that Valley Towns are dead, so they would never know that it existed and it was as vibrant as it is without the prize. What is it about the world that they're on that appeals to you as a, as a fiction writer? Uh, the people are really dramatic. They've got quite original language, really good stories, <laughs> good jokes. They're good characters. When Rachel once said to me, I was making a programme about Gwyn Thomas for his centenary, and she said, um, I love his writing because it's sweet and sour. And I thought that was a perfect description of of a lot of Ronda humour, where you you know you you do dig into those difficult experiences, but you find the funny side. Um, you extract laughter from the dark, and and both Rachel and Gwyn Thomas, you know, both fantastic Ronda writers, did that, do that. Had to see Kinsey, didn't I? He owed me a tenner for that eighth of soap we bought for Bank Holiday. Kinsey practically lives in the centre. Bank Holiday? What's so special about a Bank Holiday when you're unemployed, miss? Fucking hell, bro. Wind your neck in. It's none of your business where I go on Wednesday or on bank holiday or anything else. You're growing up here. Were you aware of any people like uh, Gwyn Thomas or Grace Davis? I didn't think anybody uh, came from around the uh, famous authors. I mean, I had quite good English teachers that I used to talk to about books. They used to recommend things I should read. I was never a Welsh uh, author or anything set in the wrong. I mean, Ron Berry was still alive at that time. I mean, yeah. I'm, still, I'm still writing and I had no idea. I was in school with his nieces and nephews. Do you think it's important to have voices of our world? Yes. You have to be able to see yourself or, you know, in, in art. Otherwise, you think you don't exist <laughs> or you're not important. He followed the babble of the river along the spinal column of the town until he got to the steep iron railway bridge hidden behind the entrance to Penarenglin Industrial Estate. The bridge seemed to tremble under his footsteps as he took the treads two at a time. So Rachel, you've used this bridge a couple of times in fiction. But why do you think it's become important for you? Well, originally because the, the short stories were about young people. It's the bridge that connects the comprehensive school to the town. As a young pupil, you were back and forth across this bridge on a regular basis. Yeah, and I mean, if you're local to the place, you know it's a, you know it's a shortcut to, to come past. This is the main line out of Triopi. Yeah, the only line out of Triopi. And did you have a sense when you were growing up that there was another big world out there and you had to get 
to it, or was this the world? Both. This was my world because I couldn't get outside, but I knew I knew there was more going on. From the time I was 15, we would go to Cardiff to see Funk off school for the day. So I was, I was aware that, you know, there was a place outside of the Rhonda. You've remained living in the Rhonda. Um, this is part of your world. Is this where you're comfortable? Yeah, I am comfortable here, and also I'm not comfortable here. There's things which are comforting. Like, it's really nice to be able to walk down the street and see people you went to school with. I think that's quite rare. But there's still a lot of poverty, there's still a lot of problems, there's still a lot of issues. We're five years on from Caleb's decision. How do you think Caleb would have feel where the Rhonda is now? Well, nothing, nothing has changed in five years, in, like, positively, from Brexit and, it, and COVID. It's just shown up even, even more inequality and problems. We're a week away from a Welsh government, a Welsh Assembly election. Are those concerns for people in the Rhonda the, the same as they were five years ago? I think people are a bit more aware now, again, because of COVID. They're watching political updates constantly on television because suddenly it really affects their lives. Um, so I think they're more interested now than they would have been five years ago. He held the chuck of the carcass steady in his mitt while he struck at the ribcage with the butt of his saw. The portion of flesh he expected to drop out stayed in its cavity in the forequarter. He lifted it by its corner with the tip of his boning knife, then continued with his hand, the bloody tissues parting with a wet slurp, the slimy, heart-shaped cut falling into his forearms. He carried it over to the deserted cutting table. As he turned to head back to primary butchering, he saw a small crowd of people standing around his caddy, men in raspberry high-vis. His first thought was that the protesters had managed to get into the factory, but these men were as headless as the ISIS hostages in Mason's video clips, swaying lingeringly from side to side the way the zombies on the walking dead shifted. The fuck? he said. He blinked. In a millisecond, the red of the men's bibs morphed into the flanks of beef sides hanging on the rail. Stupid, he said, chiding himself as he treaded cautiously across the slippery floor. He must have been tired than he thought. It explains a lot of the decisions people made that, that shocked us. The fact that the Rhonda voted for Brexit, that lots of communities in Wales voted for Brexit. You read that book and you, and you understand the context of it. It's about finding our identity and seeing our own voices out there. Not, not just for us to read, but for other people to read and, and to really think about our place within in the world. I think there's so much to take from Rachel's novel and I can't wait for it to come out so I can talk to all my friends about it. <laughs>